All Inclusive, a podcast on inclusion, innovation, and social justice with Jay Ruderman. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, and this is All Inclusive, a podcast focused on inclusion, innovation, and social justice. Christine Simmons' entire career has been built around the idea that we can achieve equality in any industry. She first began working in supplier diversity at Disney and NBC Universal, where she helped expand opportunities for businesses owned by underserved communities. She then went on to be the executive vice president of Magic Johnson Enterprises, where she led the operations of the WNBA's LA Sparks throughout their first season. She would go on to become the team's president for five seasons. In 2019, Christine made history as the first ever black and female chief operating officer of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She and her team lead the first office of representation, inclusion, and equity. She brings a new perspective to the Academy as an innovative thinker where she plays a key role in supporting the organization's new standards for diversity in front of and behind the camera. Christine, welcome to All Inclusive. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I just wanted to tell you that in preparation for this, I watched your address at the Velocity Conference, Mm -hmm. and I was struck by something that you said in the end, which I say all the time to my staff, about this is all about joy. This is all about bringing joy, I mean, doing good, but also bringing joy into our lives. And, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, because I think that's missing in our world, you know, that we overlook in, in the in the rat race of trying to accomplish things, we overlook, you know, the importance of joy in our work. Yes, I agree. And you know what, Jay, the other thing that I think is um, really important, especially in this time where we're all um, really reconciling with kind of our past and to, to the point of this entire podcast, right, about being all inclusive, using joy as almost another act of resistance, especially for those of us who have faced so much adversity, right? Whether it's those with disabilities or whether it's those from, you know, historically underutilized communities or underserved communities, you know, you don't see us just joyfully successful, just joyfully having fun. And even that, just the image of that and the um, empowerment of that and giving platform to that and that image and that story and that, that in itself is just this act of resistance that is just rooted in joy, not in pain, not in adversity, not in our challenges. And so that's really lately, it's kind of been my, my shift, like, where's the joy? Let's, let's highlight that. Um, because, you know, we've all talked about adversity for a long time and we're tired. So let's, right. let's celebrate some wins. Let's have some successes and let's show the world what joy looks like. And that, right. and that I think you always have a better outcome in that regard. So, so I appreciate being aligned in philosophy with a brilliant person like you in that regard, for sure. Well, thank you. And and it's such a powerful message that I wish other people would adopt. And you're right. We we have been going through a very difficult time with the pandemic for an extended period of time. But I wanted to talk to you. You've used the term that you failed up in not getting into medical school. Yeah. Um, but you've had this fabulous career where um, you know, you're the COO of, of the of the academy. What do you mean by that failing up? <laughs> well, you know, for me, it was kind of taking back the term fail, failure, right? And I think so many times um, you start internalizing some of this stuff um, and you internalize what society wants you to think about, what it means not to ach- achieve a goal. And and so what I started to look at, and it took me a long time, I would say maybe like I didn't start actually saying I didn't get into medical school until like five, 10 years ago, and I'll be 47 this year, I would say, oh, I decided to go another way, right? And while that also is true, I decided to go another way because I didn't get into medical school. And, and, but what I really did was looked at, okay, well, why did I not get in? Number one, what's the lesson you learn? Right. And, and then also more importantly, how did I reinvent myself? 
And so each time, and even before medical school, I was a three-letter athlete in high school, um, but I had had two uh, major knee surgeries before I'd even graduated from high school and then had another when I went on to college. So I couldn't uh, pursue, you know, my athletic career that I wanted to. Um, I even wanted to, you know, at one point be a model and that didn't work out for me. Um, and then when I didn't get into medical school and I had thought that was all that I ever wanted to do and all that I ever could be, to be able to reinvent myself from there actually made me stronger. It, it made me smarter. It made me more and I, I use this term uh, gently resilient, right? Because we do have to have a certain level of resilience, but I think at some point we do have to also not always have to be resilient. But but that being said, it, it, it made me realize that there are other options. And because that door, you know, we've always heard one door closes and another window or door opens for you. Um, and that's what happened for me. And so when that closed, I took from it all of the beauty the service, right? The desire to still empower and to uplift underserved communities, which is what my whole goal was in the first place, because my, my goal had been to do a joint MD, MBA, um, and open nonprofit health centers across the country, um, especially in uh, the areas that are underserved and underinsured, because um, I wanted to be an ER doc. And a lot of times you see um, those communities using the emergency room for their primary care because they don't have primary care. Um, and so that was the whole philosophy around it. And then when I didn't get in, I was like, okay, so now what, right? And, and now how do I continue to hold dear, hold true those aspects of who I am and what I love and, and how I want to show up in the world um, and, and then reinvent myself? And, and so I did so through my career and trying to find ways through business, um, through entertainment, through sports, through finance, through all of these ways to be able to still uplift communities in a different way. And so when you fail, at a task, right? Or you don't meet a goal, it doesn't make you a failure. It just means that you now have one, you've, you've tried and you've tried to do something new and different or bigger and better, which I love as well. Um, but that being said, you know, you also then have the opportunity to be successful at something else. Sure. And, and I know you've talked, um, I've heard you give interviews and you talked right now about the importance of giving back and and activism and and I, I remember you saying in, in a previous interview that maybe you put too much time into activism but you know my belief is like you know I'm an activist and and I think if you're an activist you're always an activist and and it really you know motivates you can you talk about you know this passion for for giving back and and how it plays a role in the in the work that you're doing right now yeah. And I love that, Jay, because, right, you you find your alignment because that is who I am. That is who you are. So how do you align that with either your career goals or your philanthropic goals or all of those other things? And and the thing is, I just wasn't in alignment. So I had to get in alignment with where my true passion was. One of my um, uh, dear friends, mentors and, and former bosses, um, she, she used to say, what's your default? What do you default to? Right. And my default was always giving back. My default was always in the community. My default was organizing and protesting and marching down Bruin Walk in, in protest, if you will. Um, and so, so when I when I joke about that, it's because most of my peers and colleagues were probably studying thirty to forty hours a week while I was both working and protesting and in, in serving mm. the community. But, but to your point, activism shows up in so many little ways that have big impacts, right? So, you know, a lot of folks think if they go into corporate America, that they can't be an activist. They feel if they go into entertainment, they, you know, can't be an activist, but for a platform, right? And um, we even talked about joy as, as, a, as an act of resistance. So there are different ways. And I think you have to really understand what impact do you want to make? And then activism is simply an intentionality of every decision you make leading towards that greater good, that greater goal um, that is bigger than yourself, in my opinion. Um, and that can happen in your day-to-day -day job. That can happen, you know, regardless of title. You don't have to have a C in front of your title, nor do you have to be part of a 501c3 to be an activist. You don't have to be marching to be an activist. It literally is the soul of who you are for those of us. And, and usually activism, empathy, right? Um, in service, all of those things come hand in hand. And you can apply those philosophies and characteristics to any job, any career, and any any path that you may choose. You know, you've talked a lot about your mother and, and, and the role that she played in your life and, you know, raising four children. And you talked about going into school and saying, well, I either had to be a doctor or a lawyer. 
Yeah. Why did you feel like there was no other option for you at that time? Yeah, you know, and I think it wasn't that per se because my mom was not a doctor nor a lawyer. In fact, she um, she actually worked at Latterman State Hospital for most of my career with the developmentally disabled community and, and helping them live more independent lives. But um, I think that as I defined what society tells us success is, and I, I, I have this distinct memory of $100,000. If I make $100,000 a year, then I am successful and I'm winning at life, right? Um, and I knew that there were two ways to do that, that just because that's what I saw, right? That's what you see on TV or in movies. Um, and also, there was a very specific path right? There was a blueprint to how you get there. And so because my mom was always working and she was raising us four crazy girls on her own and she didn't go to college. My mom dropped out of school when she was a senior in high school and then went back and got her GED. Um, so she knew nothing about the college process. One of my older sisters had gone off to school, but uh, she graduated uh, much later. But nonetheless, that whole process of what college was, of what finding a career path was, you know, I didn't have a lot of people around me who were doing a lot of different things for me to be able to not only understand what that job was or that career path was, but more importantly, I didn't see a lot of black women. And although my mom is this most beautiful skinny blonde white girl, I'm mixed, I'm biracial, um, but obviously very brown skin. Um, and, and so I didn't see a lot of, of black women you know, in those roles and, and that that was something that I could achieve or knew how to. In fact, the reason, and I always give her a shout out because um, one of my dear friends in high school, her mom was a teacher. She also was uh, black and she was, had been in honors classes her entire, her entire um, uh, scholastic career. And I was a junior in high school and she was like, Chris, why aren't you in honors? And I'm like, what's honors, right? And so because her mom had been exposed and she had been exposed, then she knew that that's what you needed to do to be able to get in, you know, to a really good school. And so Camarillo uh, Ward Henry is my girl. And so she, um, she was the one who exposed me to that. And actually we both ended up going to UCLA after that. So I think it's exposure, right? It's representation. It's being able to see it. It's being able to understand. And then also knowing though, that you don't have to have a blueprint. And I think my my career retrospectively tells you you don't have to have a blueprint because it certainly wasn't linear. Um, but the ability to be able to look at this opportunity and then apply a skill set to that and then look at this opportunity and apply a passion to that, but then figure out your career path while you're finding your center and staying uh, true to who you are. That was my entire journey. And so that's why I think I've always said that. And so now I feel so blessed to be able to have had all of these different jobs that I literally didn't know that they existed. I knew there were sports teams. I knew there were studios. I knew there were networks. I knew there were award shows, but you never know what goes on behind the scenes on how the magic is made. And so now that I've had the opportunity to pull that curtain back and be able to see it, like when I went to go work for Irvin um, at Magic Johnson Enterprises, I didn't know how you buy a sports team, right? I didn't, I didn't know how that worked, right? And now I do. And I can be able to um, enlighten and share that information with other people who may or may not look like me. It's actually, you know, you've talked a lot about UCLA and how important UCLA was to you in your life and, and still is, um, and how your advocacy and, and your passion for empowering others started at that time. But how do we do a better job right now at um, supporting the next generation of leaders and empowering them to follow their passions? You know, just show up, right? Be present, have a conversation. Um, and I think a lot of folks get intimidated by the term mentor or mentorships. Um, and so really being a mentor is having a conversation, being able to answer a couple questions, right? And, and I think, you know, the way you show up and make sure that you're giving back at any point in time, again, we're, I think we're going to say this probably 8 million times this morning, Jay, is, you know, bigger than me, know that it's bigger than me, go into everything with that intentionality that it's it's bigger than us and that that will come back to you uh, when you put it out there. Um, but that's what UCLA did for me. It laid that foundation both on how I could receive that, but also give that back to the world. And, and that's where I really discovered my love and passion for, for service and for activism 
but then also for mentorship because I had great mentors then and I've been able to pay that forward now. Um, it's critical. Social capital is amazing, right? It not only exposes and educates, but it also allows you um, to be able to change people's trajectories um, and help them overcome obstacles that they may not necessarily need to go through per se. Um, you know, we, a lot of us older folk talk about paying your dues and, you know, trials and tribulations, but, you know, I don't think that's necessary all the time. I think that you can learn lessons without necessarily having to experience adversity. And I think that's what mentorship does too. Right. It's so important to play that role. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but, you know, we did a PSA um, on authentic representation of disability in entertainment. And Octavia Spencer did the PSA, talked about the first time she authentically saw herself represented in TV or film. Do you remember the first time, you know, growing up that you saw yourself on, on, on TV or in film? Yes. Oh my gosh. It's so funny you say that because while there was a lot of different times I've seen like black women or, you know, all of that, I remember distinctly (laughs) that it was like, uh, God, what was the movie? The rock. And it was the one where, um, he goes back home and he uh, has the big stick. Oh, I kind of remember what the name of it was, but I remember seeing it in because he had biracial parents. And for me, even though, you know, my, my parents got divorced when I was seven and, and then I reconnected with my father once I was older. Um, but, you know, for both the period of time when they were together and then also the period of time when they weren't, you know, me growing up in this beautiful brown skin with a very, very, very white mom, you know, it was always a weird space for me and, and, and really trying to um, see where I fit in the world and, and to be able to see that on screen, I was like, wow, okay, so this really is okay. And especially because, you know, I'm a generation where it literally just became somewhat okay, where people, it's, you know, it's, it, people are comfortable with, with interracial relationships. I mean, yes, we've been here for a while, but, um, you know, folks still have challenges with it sometimes. And, um, and so I remember seeing that on screen, I was like, oh, he's mixed like me. And then also fast forward to when, um, you know, when Barack Obama was elected president, I was like, again, you know, biracial. And so there's so many intersectionalities of our backgrounds and how we show up in the world. Um, and, and so, so for me, those two things, because I've always had this interesting um, a place in the world where, you know, I was I was too black for some, too white for others, too this for some, too that for others, and trying to find where you fit in that world. But then when you finally see it, both in office or on the big screen is, is a really, really beautiful thing that says, okay, I belong. And I think more of us have to, you know, take recognition of that and understand, you know, the power of that, the power of representation. But on the converse side, how did the lack of representation influence you growing up? It was both a blessing and a curse, right? Because the curse obviously is you, you know, you feel sometimes as if you're the only one um, that you don't belong, right? Um, But I think the blessing of it is that you learn to find your way And if you put it in the right perspective, then you make it a priority to make sure that other folks don't feel that way too. And I think that was ultimately the path that I took. Um, You know, definitely there were some, you know, some times when you feel a little alone um, and you're trying to figure things out. Uh, but, but for me, it became, okay, well then let me go figure this out. Right. And, and one of my favorite things is creative solutioning, whether it be in the workplace, in your personal life, all of these different things, because you find such beauty in the unknown because you've now created something new, you've creatively solutioned. And so now I've creatively figured out a way for me to show up in the world, which could be um, something that another young girl or young man um, does as well and, and takes pieces from that and then says, okay, well, this part doesn't fit, but this does. So let me let me create a solution how I show up in the world. Um, and so I think those are all aspects of, of the blessing that was the lack of representation for me to be able to create that that uh, for somebody else um but it all it's also heavy sometimes and and you know there is pressure that you know for those of us that are as intentional as you and i are about the bigger picture um that 
we, I, I carry that weight every single day, you know, and I want to make sure, and I'm intentional and, and I know like on those days that I'm, I'm tired or, you know, I, I don't know if I have it to give, I think about, okay, who's looking at me, you know, or, or who else can, who else can I do this for, um, beyond my, my beautiful son, Christian, but you know, the, all of those other folks out there. And I think that's the blessing of it, but, but I hope we get to a point where, um, you know, where you and I don't have to have that conversation soon and, and, and we are truly all inclusive and, and it's just a conversation about joy. Right. Well, it's such a powerful message and, and now you're in a position where you can actually, influence how things look, uh, which we're going to get into a little in a little while. But maybe you can talk about some role models that you had growing up, people that, you know, really shaped the view of yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I say it over and over and I'll say it over and over again. My mom, um, you know, Arnita is fantastically resilient. She is such a beautiful, feisty soul. Um, she, I mean, she literally raised four crazy independent women on her own. Um, and I don't know how she did it. I'm, I'm struggling with my one and, and she had four of us. And so my mom obviously was, was one, you know, growing up, I think there wasn't a whole lot, but as I got older, Obviously, Irvin uh, Magic Johnson has been, you know, phenomenally influence, uh, a phenomenal influence on my life. Um, you know, I've had a, a lot of, and I love the ones that fly under the radar. There's, there's women like um, Cassandra Charles first. Um, she was uh, one of my bosses in early on in my career. She uh, led supplier diversity for uh, United Technologies. And she actually gave me my first real opportunity after I didn't get into medical school um, and helped me find that passion, right? Um, there is uh, Dylan Aino. She was the one who I mentioned earlier who said, you know, what is your default? Um, and I worked with her while I was at Disney. And so these phenomenal women that fly under the radar and are constantly doing this work that nobody ever sees or knows about. I think those were all um, phenomenal role models that through my career, I've been able to kind of pick their brains. And then there's a lot of other brilliant folks who have exposed me again to, to the bigger aspects of the world and, and how to make an even larger impact. So I always pick from different ones. You know, I love and adore the work that Ava does, Ava DuVernay, and how she shows up in the world and how she tells her stories, right? Um, Cicely Tyson, literally, um, one of my favorite phrases in life is strength in grace. And if you close your eyes and you think about that phrase, you literally can't think of anybody else but Cicely Tyson, right? So those are those types of women and how they showed up in the different times that they showed up in the different in the different environments that they showed up and, and how they defined a being a powerful woman in their own right and realm. For me, um, I, I've learned to, to kind of pick from each of them and, and find a piece of that that makes up this, this mosaic that, that is before you today. Well, you've had that, these wonderful experiences of, of interacting with people who are real icons that most of us do not know. Um, Magic Johnson, we know to be, you know, a wonderful person, but you've gotten to know him personally. And it sounds like he's really, you know, been an inspiration to you in, in, in addition to being a colleague. Yeah, you know, I um, I first met Irvin uh, on the campus of UCLA, which is hilarious because I um, I was working on campus. I, I just graduated. I was working on campus, but I was still trying to get into medical school. He'd opened his clinics across the country, and so I wanted to pick his brain because I too wanted to open my clinics. And so, um, so we we connected. And at that point in time, it was right when a lot of the NBA players um, were unfortunately losing a lot of their wealth. And so, um, when he did uh, give me the opportunity to be able to pick his brain about the clinics. We also connected a lot about how do we help um, help these athletes use their platform in the same way that Irvin did, and that it's important to be able to change their trajectories and, and help them uh, maintain and, and create more generational wealth in their communities. Um, and that was one of the philosophical uh, points that we connected on very early on. Um, we parted ways, and then uh, when I was at Disney again, um, I, I was charged with increasing the amount of money that we spend with a, a number of different areas, but one of them specifically, one of my specific goals was, was black owned businesses. And of course, Irvin had been doing a lot of work in that space. And so 
I reached out, I'll never forget, and, and I took my uh, my boss, my boss's boss from Disney, uh, and we, we set up a meeting with him, and he said, hello to my boss, nice to meet you, and my boss's boss, who was the acting chief procurement officer at that point at Disney, nice to meet you, and then he said, he's like, I know you, and he grabs me, and he... Forehead, Uncle Uncle Irvin forehead kissed me, right? And, and my, my boss, my boss's boss were looking at me crazy like, oh, you know magic like that? And I was just like, well. But that being said, he is that endearing. Um, he always remembers a face. He always remembers an interaction. Um, and he definitely remembers people. And it's amazing given the gazillion people that he meets every single day. Um, but what's most beautiful about Irvin, I think, is his heart. And um, in fact, it was it was always so beautiful that oftentimes those of us that worked for him on the business side of things, he would go and he'd be like, oh, we're going to do all of these great, beautiful things. And then we all had to figure out how to make it happen. Um, and so after a while, we were like, OK, can, <laughs> we need to kind of figure this thing out. But his boldness, right? his vision for economic empowerment within underserved communities and specifically within the black community from an early point in his career. He used to tell stories about how he'd be on the basketball court and when they were, and I think part of this might be a little embellished, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it always makes for a good story, but he would, he would talk about when they were blowing people out um, at the Lakers on the court, he would sit there and chat with the courtside seat members who were usually icons and, and titans in business and then and form those relationships with them. So then when he um, he knew that he wanted to do a lot more beyond basketball and he had begun laying that groundwork uh, while he was there. So all of those are beautiful lessons that um, I learned from Irvin. And, and again, when we talk about relentlessly reinventing yourself, right? So he started as a basketball player. Then he, he was one of the first ones to start really um, owning name and likeness, if you will. He really set the foundation for most athletes in that regard. Then he went on to his endorsement deals. Then he went on to his, his licensing and retail and his, his brick and mortar, which I think a lot of people probably know him best for in the business world. Then uh, Starbucks, right? Uh, his TGI Fridays, his 24-hour fitnesses, those at the theaters as well, um, right? And then from there... He reinvented himself again because that was right around when the recession hit and he said he knew uh, or he, he realized he knew he had to diversify his portfolio. So he started creating in, in joint ventures and strategic alliances um, with various B2B businesses. And that's when I came into play. I mean, he recruited me to come work for him. Uh, and we had a staffing company. Uh, we also had a food and facilities management company. In fact, he still has that company. Um, we would, and, and that's actually how we connected because um, he bid on a contract at Disney to feed our employees back of house, both at Disneyland and Disney World. And he held on to that contract for quite some time. Then he went on to supply chain. He even um, owned a, a, a burger, a meat company, a beef company that supplied the beef to Burger King for your Whoppers for quite some time. And now he's again reinvented himself to go into uh, infrastructure funds, uh, to insurance companies, and, and of course to sports teams. So that being said, um, that type of reinvention and to be able to see that and how it works and to see someone who looks like you to be able to transcend and change their trajectory all the while. And he always said this, we're always giving back. There was always some type of philanthropic um, aspect of what we did, which also I love because I feel like, yes, we can all do good with our 501c3s, but you can also do a lot of good as well just in regular organizations and corporations too. And that's what he did every time he did a deal. So, so those are all the things that, you know, I love and appreciate and, and respect him for. Um, and, and I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity and privilege to be able to be exposed to and work for. Well, he sounds like an amazing individual, super successful and, and a privilege for you to have spent the time with him. Um, you know, I know you've spent, you know, most of your career in entertainment and we're going to get back to the Academy and where you are now, but you spent five seasons working as the COO of the LA Sparks and, and, and what you learned from that experience. Oh, I love the Sparks so much. I still do. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a beautiful legacy of a brand, yet it was young. Right. And it still is right as a sports league goes, you know, 25 years this year in the league um, is is still young as a sports team. And, you know, I learned so much about taking a legacy, um, reinventing it again. I, I think that's going to be our, our one of our another one of our keywords today, but reinventing that brand and and refreshing it. So that way we can look at the world differently. And I, what I mean by that is. You know, yes, it's a women's league. Yes, it's about women's basketball. So obviously there's some advocacy there 
that has to happen just by the nature of, of the business. But what we found in that, and I think it's a true lesson with where we are in the world right now, is that when you invest in these diverse communities, when you focus on them, when you target them um, for, for true partnership, it can truly reap its rewards. And, and so what we did is rather than going the traditional sports route of constantly trying to convert you know, your hardcore basketball fans, you know, the guys that are following our magic bird, Kobe, LeBron, we were, we, we had tried to convert those folks in the same time that we spent trying to convert them. We said, you know what? Let's look at other markets, right? So let's look at, let's look at those socially conscious millennials who are really focused on where they want to spend their money, but still want to have a really good time, right? And, and have some good disposable income. Let's talk to those families, those moms and dads who maybe are a little tired of watching Pokemon. Oh, wait, that might just be me, but have a great time, you know, have a great place to go and, and spend some good time with with their kids as a family, so a family-friendly environment. And then also, let's target those folks, typically women, um, but not always, uh, you know, so those that identify as women, um, but but those that may not necessarily be basketball fans, but are fans of of women's empowerment, of, of advocacy, and of all of those things. Let's make it a fun environment. We'll make them Sparks fans. And then they may come around and be basketball fans. And in doing that and targeting those three populations and target demographics or psychographics, even, um, we were able to lead the league in ticket sales. We uh, won a championship, right? We led the league in attendance as well. We revamped the brand. Our ratings were 30% higher than, you know, other male professional sports teams on our same network. And so we found success. In, in not taking the NBA's model and throwing a pink bow on it, right? Or all of those things, but really thinking about what does this mean to each individual and how can we um, translate that into our business, operationalize it, right? Because once you operationalize it, it's not an initiative, it's not a marketing campaign, it's simply who you are and how you do business. And I think that's what really is the key um, to true, impactful, and sustainable change. So do you see um, women's sports leagues growing in America and around the world? I mean, do you think there's a, there's a bright future for these leagues? I really do. I really do. I mean, you see, in fact, there's a documentary coming out, I believe, on um, on what the women's soccer team did. But 100 percent, you're you're absolutely seeing it. Um, I think there's two things that are happening. One, um, you have amazing, empowered women who are pushing the envelope and no longer settling for um, for anything less than equity. Right. And that's key because for a long time we would settle and we would just take that, which was, you know, okay, we'll hand, we'll give you this little piece or, or that over there. No, we're looking for equity. Right. And then I think that, and also to, to correct the inequities that have been for so long. I think the other beautiful thing is that we're getting a lot more enlightened men or those that identify as men uh, that say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with this. Right. And we're raising them. Right. So even my son, uh, it, it was funny because he started going to Sparks games when he was like three years old. And so, and he started playing ball too, you know, with, with boys and girls. And, and so, you know, men, sports guys would come and be like, which, who's your favorite player? What's your favorite team? And he'd be like, Sparks, Candace Parker. And they would look and like, no, no, no. Who's your favorite basketball team? And he'd look at me like confused. And he's like, oh, oh. and I'm like, they mean men's basketball, sweetie. And he was like, oh, okay, Lakers, Kobe, you know, and LeBron, da, 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 da. <laughs> and, and so to be able to expose kids, right, boys and girls, that basketball is basketball, right? So we don't make a distinction between Olympic basketball or college basketball or the big three or any of that, right? It's basketball. It's just the different rules and the different people that are playing it, but it's all still basketball. And so if we start that foundation early, and then especially those people that are raising those kids are raising them in an enlightened way, then we have a really, really bright future. I think the third piece of it that we still have a lot of work to do on is the general ecosystem, right? So we talk a lot about equal pay. And this goes for talent, right, in the entertainment industry. This goes for athletes uh, in the sports industry. But what is the ecosystem? 
right? The sponsorships, the media deals, the masters, the ownership, all of those pieces of it, we have to hold everybody accountable because typically it's not the team owners, it's not the players, it's not the talent, right? It's not what people think is the most obvious. It's okay, well, those media rights deals that we're talking about that are hundreds of millions of dollars for some and zero for others, right? Why isn't there equity there? And and when we talk about sponsorships, when we talk about um, media exposure, when we talk about journalism and, and how much, how many folks are covering these different folks and their talents that they have, all of that has to also happen. So that way those leaks can truly thrive and be successful as well. Well, you obviously remain really passionate about women's basketball, um, but I want to transition to your role as the COO of the Academy and running the first ever Office of Representation, Inclusion, and Equity. Can you tell me about what you and your team are working on? Yes. Oh, we're so excited. And we brought on the very talented Janelle English. We, we, we brought her over from the Discovery Channel. I um, mean, she's been amazing leading the office for us. But there's so much, Jay. And, and I think that's the key because there's been passion and there has been initiatives uh, prior uh, you know, to my coming here and, and much work that had been done prior to. But that being said, we needed to look at it holistically. We needed to look at it operationally. Right. We needed to make sure that we had some the, the discipline. Right. There's an entire industry around diversity, equity and inclusion, as we, we are seeing now and, and aspects where you know which levers you can pull and what impact that will make. So we're doing unconscious bias training for those committee members who bring in members who will be part of our academy family. Um, we've called the initiative Aperture, and we chose that word um, because we are looking to broaden the lens through which excellence is recognized. And that's really important, right? Because if we're only looking through this tiny little lens, we've missed all of the beauty and excellence and stories and artists that are out here. And I think we as um, our filmmaking community can really relate to that. Um, so that's part of the changing hearts and minds, having really honest conversations about where we've been, about who we are, and about how we stand in this industry. Um, you know, we're default leaders, right? And we also get the negative. You know, we saw that with Oscar So White and, and some of the other challenges that have come with our industry. We're going to get the negative aspect of it. How can we now be not be reactive and actually be proactive leaders and, and understand our role um, and how people view us in the industry? And so the Academy and the board has really taken that to heart. Um, and so in doing so, you know, things like our inclusion standards for best picture, which we have implemented, we're really, really proud of those. The board and our committees have done such an amazing job. And, and of course, um, the, the staff that have been working diligently to put this thing together, but, you know, and, and also learnings from our colleagues. That was another aspect of our, our mindset that we had to shift. You know, historically, we typically would just announce some things that we would do and let the world react. This time we really wanted to be collaborative because we wanted to have a sustainable impact across the entire industry. So we we are so grateful for the lessons learned from our brothers and sisters at BAFTA. We um, went and talked to the major studios, the mini studios, to the guilds, to the union. Like we talked to all different folks to help us understand how we can really make sure that what we're doing has an impact. And so those inclusion standards are really focused on four standards. But ideally, the the long story short is that. We want to make sure that there's diversity both in front of the camera, representation in front of the camera and behind the camera, um, as well as uh, in the pipeline. And so that way we can continue to ensure that everything that we're looking at um, has that, that broader lens of excellence, if you will. And But more important, we have to acknowledge we don't make movies, right? The studios are making movies and, you know, independents are making movies. And, and so when they get to us, we want to make sure that people understand that this is also excellent. There's lots of different ways that excellence can be seen. And so continuing to diversify our membership base, continuing to look at um, the the awards is, is key. And those are all the cool kind of sexy ones that everybody, you know, wants to read about. But some of the stuff that's just as important, because when you do this work, 
you have to change who you are, right? Like we talked about, if you're an activist, right? How do you make that activism happen in every aspect of what you do? So we want to make sure that we are walking the walk internally. And so that's everything from our internship programs, which we are so honored to have a partnership with you on, um, and the Rudiman Foundation uh, to, you know, our suppliers. We launched our supplier diversity program this year, which we're very excited about to ensure that our vendors and our suppliers are diverse as well, and that we're doing those that we're doing business with. Um, our marketing, right? Where are we spending our marketing dollars? You know, making sure that we have really good, authentic relationships with media, especially multicultural media outlets, so that way they too can get some exclusives or get spots on the red carpet, because all of that's important. Again, back to the entire ecosystem. How can we affect change in that entire ecosystem? All the way up to our um, investments committee, which is chaired by the incomparable Melody Hobson. Um, but we were able to direct um, almost two hundred million dollars to diverse portfolio managers out of our, you know, our investments. So these are ways that we're making sure that we're walking the walk internally. All the stuff behind the curtain that nobody knows happens at this organization, but is so important. And that's inclusive not only of of our ethnic backgrounds, right? Our international outreach, those with disabilities, um, our LGBTQ family. All of these aspects of who we are and how we show up are so important to make sure that they're integrated in every aspect of what we do from our staff to our collections at the library, to our collections at the archive, and of course, our beautiful museum that's going to be opening later on this month. Hmm. Well, first of all, you're doing so much <laughs> and, and so comprehensively, um, but it, I'm also impressed that the Academy has really empowered you and your team to really, you know, make a difference. And we talked about the standards uh, for best film, which, which, you know, in some sense for many people in the industry are controversial, but don't you feel that film, TV, film, entertainment really shapes public attitude and, and in terms, some ways more than most industries have an impact on how we see each other as Americans and also as citizens of the world. Hundred percent. I mean, um, and again, I cannot give enough credit to our board of governors and um, all of our artists and and our academy members, and of course our CEO Don Hudson, whom they all, um, our, our president David Rubin, have all done so much hard work on this, um, and 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 we as the staff are there to help you know, um, execute, of course, uh, but to stand firm in it. Cause you're right. There was a lot of criticism, right. You know, and especially when we're talking about art, art is subjective, art is an expression of oneself. Um, and so it's very tough. We have to walk that line of not limiting or censoring anybody's artistic expression or their story. And that's not what we're doing. We're not telling people what stories they can or cannot say, but what we are saying is that if you're not painting with every beautiful color in your palette, then you may not have as beautiful of an art piece there, right? And so we want to make sure that folks are tapping into every single color in that palette so that way we can create even more beautiful art. And I think if we if we shift our mindset um, to all that opens up in possibility versus that which we're losing and the potential loss that one individual may have, I think that's when people see the opportunity and the beauty and the joy that lies therein. And so, you know, yes, kudos to, again, to the born in staying fast in it, to your point, to be able to empower us to put the tools together um, so that artists can utilize those tools as well. Um, but also, you know, hats off to the artists that are embracing it and are now um, telling these stories that we've never seen told in the ways that we've we've been seeing them show up. And, and that's a beautiful thing too. And it just makes our, our filmmaking community stronger. It is beautiful. I want to talk about you personally um, as the first black and female COO of the Academy must be a lot of pressure. I mean, to be the first, how do you deal with that? <laughs> um, it is because it's important that I'm not the last, right? We heard Kamala say that we've heard a lot of people say that. That's why it's important. Um, it's not important because Christine Simmons was the first. It's important because if Christine Simmons is the first and the last, then I have failed. Then we have failed. Um, and, and, and also that it's not just the first black. We need, we need everybody, right? We need everybody to be able to hold these positions, to hold space 
at this level. So that way we all have those lived experiences that will inform those organizations' decisions that, to our earlier point, influence the world, literally, right? So so to me, um, it does weigh very heavily on me um, because I, I know that I cannot um, fail um, and that it is important that we continue uh, to break down all of these, these barriers again. And, and all of this is just simply towards the mission of our organization so that we can create the processes um, I can lend my expertise for the ability to operationalize the good so the artists can can be celebrated and the art um, can be and the, and the legacy of, of filmmaking can be preserved all of it so so it does weigh heavily on me um, but you surround yourself with amazing people uh, with like-minded folks and just stay in the positive um, and and do the work right I, I I love the work I love but more than the work I love the the outcomes and the impact and that inspires me so so you are working in a community um that is an artistic community that is very outspoken they're activists also um talk a little bit about you know some very prominent campaigns like oscar so white the me too era mm -hmm. how that impacts your work as um being the ceo of, of a leading organization within the entertainment industry yeah, um, you know, I, w I wasn't here for Oscar So White, and um, and of course, Me Too has has definitely um, started and evolved uh, uh, both before and, and while I was here. I think that you know those campaigns, while challenging for for the organizations that you know are being affected, challenge us to be better, though, right? And it challenges us to grow, and it. It, it calls the question and you always have to have folks that call the question, right? I, I often refer to this work um, and it's analogous to, uh, and again, back to my mom world of when you have a kid, they constantly ask you why, right? And so when you're doing something, uh, you have to ask the organization and everybody in it, well, why are we doing that? And if we're doing that just because we always did it that way or we always did that, then maybe we want to challenge that because innovation won't come from that. So when you have an Oscar so white, we do have to challenge um, ourselves to look inside and say, OK, how do we evolve when our industry has a moment like Me Too? We have to look and say, OK, well, how do we deconstruct um, all of the, the, the reasons and the ways we got here and understand it, but do so with compassion and empathy? Um, but also help evolve, right? So this isn't, you know, Oscar So White, Me Too, isn't a, an attack on any one group of people, right? But it is a, a way for all of us to ask more questions and, and to be able to evolve who we are and where we are. And it, it, a lot of it starts with transparency, right? And that's what we're also seeing with a lot of our organizations these days is, is and, and what, what the general public is looking for is transparency, right? And making sure that they understand exactly the why, because transparency leads to representation and equity. It really does. You can't have representation and equity without transparency. And so um, being able to be a part of that, um, to be able to... Uh, put a pro so I've always, I've always talked about process over personality. Yes, you are passionate about this and I am passionate about this. But if you and I leave and we go and retire on some beautiful island somewhere because we won the lottery, right? How do we make sure that this work continues? Um, and, and so how do we put in, you know, operation, uh, operational aspects that, that support equity? So whether it's the standards of conduct that help combat accusations, whether it's um, supporting organizations like the Hollywood Commission, of which we um, are a member as well, which are working to fight against abuse uh, in our industry, if you will, um, alongside the, again, incomparable Anita Hill, right? Or whether it's Oscar So White, and, and we really have to talk to ourselves and say, okay, what is happening and what's, what's, what's going on? So that way we can fix it and fix it faster. So it sounds like I mean I, I I believe that 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 the Oscars sort of set the standards um, for the industry in many ways in, in terms of the award shows um, 
what are the action plans? What what are the action plans that are going to promote equity and inclusion in the industry? Sure. Um, so you know that's that was key, right? So when we when we set out on this journey, one of the conversations we had and that I shared was that if we do this, it cannot be performative. It actually has to be actionable, right? So that's in that's indeed where the inclusion standards came out. Um, it's also you know the different things that we're putting in place so that way we not only look at the next class of members to ensure that they're diverse, but also the pipeline coming up behind them. Also looking at the criteria. Let's make sure that our criteria um, for getting into the academy and becoming a member also um, uh, provides an opportunity for all and doesn't reinforce any inequities that have been in the industry that maybe we didn't create, but we might be reinforcing, right? So let's question those, let's look at them, and then let's continue to, um, to evolve and make sure they're as equitable as possible. Right. Well, I think what's coming out in our discussion, which I think people are going to be happily uh, surprised, is that the Academy is really on top of change and and, and really has made that an internal uh, goal for the Academy. Christine, the, the Ruderman Family Foundation is really proud of our partnership with the Academy. And I did notice that the last um, uh, award ceremony was much more inclusive than they have been in the past. Um do you see plans for people with disabilities to be authentically portrayed both uh, in front and behind the camera? Oh, that is the dream. That is the goal. And whatever we can do to influence that uh, is, is is already in the works, to be quite honest with you. So yes, we were very intentional about it. Um, we partnered with Google um, we on making sure that we uh, had the video descriptions. Um, we literally reinvented the, we worked with our production team to reinvent invent the ramp so that way um, the way that everybody accesses that stage is the same. And ultimately that's the goal. We want just the normal, beautiful, successful joy that we saw on the red carpet with the Crip Camp team. Oh my gosh, it was the most beautiful red carpet moment ever um, to be normal. And for us not to even have this conversation so that way everybody can just see what's happening. Now we still have a lot to learn. You know, it there were some challenges that we had and we want to make sure that we, but we are so open and and we want we want it to be great because without that again we don't have every single aspect of of this beautiful artistic community so that 100 percent is the goal and we are continually working to make sure that happens christine it was a pleasure talking to you i'm sure we'll talk again yes um thank you so much and thank you for being a guest on all inclusive jay thank you for having me thank you for the work that the ruderman foundation does thank you for your partnership it was an honor Have a great, great day. Thank you. Thank you. All Inclusive is a production of the Ruderman Family Foundation. Our key mission is the full inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. You can find All Inclusive on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. To view the show notes, transcripts, or to learn more, go to rudermanfoundation.org slash all-inclusive. Have an idea for a podcast? Be sure to tweet at Jay Ruderman.